last but certainly not least, everyone's favorite, not really, everyone's like, oh, the reproductive systems, do I have to hear about that again? Yeah, actually, you're probably going to hear about it until you're about my age and you feel like you know everything, but you still might hear it from somebody. So, the funny thing is, you'd be amazed that there's probably a lot of things you don't know. You kind of feel like you know your body really well, but uh, chances are you probably don't really know it as well as you probably should. So, nonetheless, let's get into the reproductive system. So, we're going to talk about the male reproductive system and the female. And we're not going to go into crazy depth because I know that a lot of you guys do know some of this stuff, but at the same time, there is some stuff that might be new to you, okay? Let's start with the males. If any of you guys know these boy bands, these are from the 80s, so you probably don't because you weren't born yet. But anyways, um, <laughs> I just think of like the male reproductive system and like these cute little boy bands who are like all the rage back then. So I'm not sure if you guys really know the male anatomy. If you're a male, you might know a little bit better than females, but um, you'd be amazed at the stuff that you might not know about your parts. So the parts for the male. You have the testes, okay? So obviously down here, you have the testicle, the epididymis that sits up here. The epididymis is basically where sperm is produced. That and the testicle, as well as this vas deferens, which is the basically the um, tube that takes the semen out through the urethra, urethra. They're all housed in the scrotum, okay? And the scrotum basically is the sac that allows for temperature control in order to produce sper sperm, because sperm actually need a slightly cooler temperature than our bodies. That's why they're outside our bodies. And um, obviously the scrotum does some interesting things in order to regulate the temperature by um, shrinking up and relaxing and stuff like that, all on its own, just to provide the correct temperature for sperm production, okay? So there's the testes, the epididymis, again, that is basically where the sperm are um, housed and produced and stored. They're, they're actually produced in the testicle, stored in the epididymis. Then they travel through the vas deferens, okay? And if you notice here, the seminal vesicle and the prostate gland. These are two things that basically aid in lubrication and producing parts of the semen other than the sperm. So that's what those two um, basically glands or accessory organs is what we call them, um, function in and aid in, okay? And then um, all of that stuff will be taken out through the urethra, out through the penis, okay? Um, and then we're not shown here is the bulbal urethra or the cowper's gland, okay? And um, I won't get into that because that's not going to be anything you're tested on. But those are the main parts of the male reproductive system. Many of you males might know a little bit, but you probably didn't know what a lot of this does. And you've heard of these terms, but um, the prostate gland is one thing that um, males really need to be kind of conscious of because that's where cancer starts to um, creep up in a lot of men kind of middle-aged and, um, you know, beyond the age 40, 50. So it's very interesting that this has become kind of a site for um, common cancers in males, okay? So now the females. Now how you females feel about your anatomy. Wonder if you guys know as much as you really think you do. Probably women tend to know a little bit more about their bodies because we seem to be a little bit more in tune because we have a lot of things going on in there, okay? Here's the lovely girl band, Spice Girls. <laughs> you guys probably don't even know who that is. Okay, so the girl parts, <laughs> ovaries. So the ovaries are up here. That's what produces the egg. And I'm going to show you a more um, kind of detailed picture of that. But that's where the eggs are produced. Well, I shouldn't say, sorry, scratch that. They're not produced over time. You're actually born with all of your eggs that you're going to have for the rest of your life. So that's where they're housed, but that's where they mature. So they're not produced. They're already kind of there waiting to just mature and then be ovulated, okay? So basically from there, from the ovary, you have these fallopian tubes that lead towards the uterus, okay? So that's where the egg will travel down to the uterus. And if it meets up with the sperm and is fertilized, it will implant in this uterus right here. And um, basically then that's when we'll have the preparation for um, growing a baby, childbirth, and all that stuff, which we'll get into. So hang tight for that. But the uterus, um, on a monthly basis, builds its lining up in preparation for fertilization, okay? So we all know, and we'll talk about this again, that women have a menstrual cycle every month where if there's no fertilization and no implantation of an egg, then this lining sloughs off, okay? And that's in the form of the menstrual cycle. 
Okay. Um, so then if, um, you know, basically your menstrual cycle or if you have a baby, it's all going to come down the same thing. Okay. Right here is the cervix right here and then the vagina and out. Okay. Um, very different than males because we do not, uh, males have their semen and their urine come out the same tube. We do not. Okay. If you notice, there's the bladder right here and then the um, urethra right here. Okay. So that's where basically you, we as women are um, expelling our urine. Okay. So there's the differences. So moving on from there, and I'm not going to get into the whole sexual part of it. That's not what I'm here to teach about. I'm just here to teach about the lovely reproductive systems and basically how they function and what um, involves what's involved in that. So the infamous menstrual cycle. I don't know why I came up with those terms, the infamous. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, it is something that most everybody knows about, um, but it's very interesting to see all of the hormones involved. So I said take note of all the hormones involved. So you have different hormones. So remember males, um, you know, you have the, the testosterone that's being produced in order to make a man a man, right? Like the deepening of the voice, the hair on the chest and the face and um, stuff like that. Um, well, women, of course, we produce a little bit of testosterone, but we also produce many other hormones, okay? Estrogen being one of them, but all of these other ones, luteinizing hormones, um, follicle stimulating hormone, progesterone, um, estrogen, all of these different hormones, okay? So here's showing kind of what's happening throughout the menstrual cycle. So I'm going to show you first down here. This is the uterus, um, the uterine lining. Okay, so basically, um, the here is where the period is, is starting. So basically, that urine, that um, uterine wall is sloughing off. Okay, so notice how it gets kind of thin here. Then about 14 days, here's where about ovulation occurs. So as ovulation occurs, and remember, ovulation starts in the ovary and moves its way down the fallopian tube. So it's not in the uterine you know, it's not in the uterus yet, but ovulation occurs right here and that wall starts to build up again. So if implantation were to occur, it would be right in this time period, about 28 days. If it doesn't happen, then it's left off again. If you notice these um, hormone levels, okay, they drop here during the menstrual cycle, but then as we get towards ovulation, all of these hormones start to spike. So you can see that all these things start to spike because you're ovulating, so your body now has to prepare for this possible baby, okay? So um, the only hormone that does not spike is progesterone. So it's interesting that that's what all of these um, pregnancy tests are starting to test for, are basically some of the different signs in the hormone levels, okay? Um, in particular, progesterone, um, and then sometimes these FSH and LH, the luteinizing and the follicle stimulating. So anyways, that's kind of what's happening during ovulation. Again, also, you'll notice that some people take um, kind of note of their body temperature. So you can tell when your body temperature rises that you've actually ovulated. Now, it's not that it rises to the point of a fever, but maybe from 98.6, it rises to 90, um, 99.3. So it's not a huge jump, but it's enough of a jump to know that, you know, hey, something's going on in my body. Um, so here's what's happening with the egg. Here's um, kind of the, the little ovum. Okay, it's growing follicle, growing, growing, and then ovulated right here. It's kind of expelled from the um, ovary, okay? And as it gets to here then, um, if it's not fertilized in this time period, then it turns into what we call a corpus luteum and basically becomes kind of a waste material because it, 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 it goes out with the menstrual cycle. So there's kind of a little bit about the menstrual cycle. <clears throat> So we have reprodu reproductive glands, and we talked about this with the endocrine system, that glands secrete hormones, okay? So in particular, we have the ovaries and the testes. So here's the testes. Again, it's secreting testosterone, okay? Um, it's gonna also produce sperm, but the main function is producing sperm, secreting testosterone. With that t without enough testosterone, lots of things can happen in a male. A, you, you maybe you don't pr produce sperm because sperm needs that um, testosterone, um, kind of it's just all this hormone balance, okay? Um, also other things obviously wouldn't occur as um, certain characteristics are basically because of testosterone, okay? And same with the ovaries. Obviously produces the egg or the ova, but also secretes, secretes estrogen and progesterone, okay? So without those hormones, um, you wouldn't have normal ovulation, you wouldn't possibly be able to carry a baby and become pregnant. So those hormones are very important in 
um, reproduction, but also um, the femaleness, okay? So if we have too much estrogen or not enough estrogen, different things can happen, okay? So those are the reproductive things. So we talked a little bit, um, I'll get into kind of a little bit more about the egg, but let's talk a little bit about the sperm. So something we call spermatogenesis, okay? And I'm not, you're not gonna be tested on this, but this is all about going back to mitosis and meiosis, right? You guys remember that? So here, this is where we kind of figure out how this is all happening. Because remember, with um, spermatogenesis and then fertilization, we get that crossing of genetic material, and that's meiosis. That's where we undergo that. But in order to produce meiosis, okay, or I mean in order to produce sperm, we have to undergo meiosis as well. So here's the thing. We start off with the spermatogonium. These are kind of stem cells that basically will become sperm, okay? But they are two end, so we call those a diploid cell. They undergo mitosis to create, you know, to produce this exact replica, right? Then it undergoes meiosis, and meiosis is completed, and you undergo meiosis two, which basically halves these cells. So you start off with two, but you end up with four sperm cells, okay? So it's very important to understand that mitosis creates exact, exact replica. But once you have meiosis, it's actually halving that number, okay? Um, you're not producing this clone necessarily anymore. You're now just halving the number, and you have a different sperm. Every sperm is different. They have different genetic material. Some sperm are, you know, and if you guys have ever heard that um, males are the reason for the sex of the baby, okay? When you go and get, if you get pregnant, or you're trying for a baby or whatever, um, the male is always the one that... The, the sperm is the one that dictates the um, sex of the baby. So all of these sperms are different due to meiosis. So just know that basically from one spermatogonium, you're gonna end up with four sperm cells, okay? That's known as spermatogenesis. Now, oogenesis is a little bit different, okay? You start off with what we call an oogonium, okay? Which is turns into undergoing um, mitosis, a primary oocyte, okay? So this is mitosis. And then you undergo meiosis here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is meiosis one. Mitosis would have actually occurred over here. Um, so meiosis one, you end up with a primary oocyte, okay? Which then turns into a secondary oocyte and a polar body. A polar body is basically nothing. It's not going to turn into anything. It's going to be expelled as waste product. But from one primary oocyte, you do end up with one egg and three polar bodies. So unlike the sperms, where you end up with, you know, four sperm total, here you only end up with one egg cell and then three polar bodies that are just expelled. Okay, so that's oogenesis, so a little bit different. So you're undergoing mitosis before, you undergo meiosis, but then you end up with this oogonium, primary oocyte, secondary oocyte, and egg, and then basically you have these polar bodies that are missing. So hopefully that kind of makes a little bit of sense. Again, when you get into, you know, college level biology, you'll actually talk about that a lot more. And if you take anatomy, which is really kind of cool. So um, here's a good picture of just showing kind of the um, primary oocyte right here. The primary follicle turns into, you know, obviously you have the, o the ovary here. Or I'm sorry, the ovary is housing it and this, um, this egg. Here is the, you know, secondary oocyte that's turning into the egg right here. The polar bodies are just kind of off floating around. They're not going to do anything. Okay, they're going to end up being um, broken down by other things in the ovary. And then, um, obviously, as it moves closer here, it's going to be expelled as ovulation, okay? And then turns into cor corpus lydia, luteum, which is nothing, okay? The egg will always be ovulated, but it, basically this turns into nothing, and that kind of goes through the cycle again, where it um, turns into kind of something that's going to prepare for the oocyte again, okay? All right, so how about when the two join? So once upon a time, there was a sperm and an egg, okay, and the two joined, and that's known as fertilization. Yes, you guys have all heard that. You've seen pictures like that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about it. The definition is the process of a sperm joining an egg. If an egg is to be fertilized, sperm must be present in the fallopian tube, okay? That's the only way that it can happen. You don't have fertilization in the uterus. You don't have fertilization in the ovary. It, it tends to happen in the fallopian tube, okay? The egg surrounded by a thick protective layer that contains binding sites to which sperm can attach. So you actually have tons of sperm that try to attach, but notice the only one will be able to fertilize it. 
after it's fertilized, it kind of has this crazy protective thing over it that no other sperm can get in. Okay, so never are two sperm going to fertilize an egg. It just won't happen. There's too much genetic information. It would never be fertilized. <clears throat> it wouldn't happen. So one sperm, one egg. Okay. So more about fertilization. When a sperm attaches to that binding site, a sac in the sperm head ruptures, and it releases these powerful enzymes that break down that protective layer of the egg. Okay, so that sperm is kind of you know getting its way in there, and then all of a sudden it will explode, and these enzymes kind of start to eat away through the egg. Once the sperm enters the egg, the membrane around the egg and the sperm nuclei rupture, and the nuclei are joined, and the fertilized egg is now called a zygote. So that's another term that you're going to hear me throwing out. A zygote is a fertilized egg. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about early development. So once you have that fertilization occur, cell division is going to instantly start to take place. Okay, so it will take place continually until the embryo is a solid ball of about 50 cells. It's called a morula. Okay, so that's about four days after fertilization. You have this ball of cells, um, which is really cool because they're already starting to differentiate and be... Um, you know, this, this human, so it's pretty cool. Um, so then a fluid-filled cavity is going to form in the center of the embryo, transforming it into a hollow structure called a blastocyst. So here's a picture of it. You have the sperm and egg. Once it's, um, you know, the sperm makes its way in there, it's a zygote. So basically it'll form that membrane where no other sperm can enter in. Then you have cell division, two cells, four cells, and so forth, until you have about 50 cells, which is called a morula. Then it hollows out and you have a blastula, okay? Then it moves into something called the gastrula where now you're gonna start to see those three levels of cells that are going to turn into very specific parts of your body. So it's pretty cool. Okay, so about six, after about six or seven days after fertilization, the blastocyst attaches itself to the wall of the uterus, okay? So we call that implantation. So that's only six or seven days. So it moves down the fallopian tube and then it attaches itself to the uterus. A cluster of cells forms in the cavity, which eventually forms three cell layers, which we've talked about this early on in the animal organization, the ectoderm, the mesoderm, and the endoderm. That process is known as gastrulization, um, or gastrulation, where basically those three layers are gonna become your muscles, your nervous system, and your glands and organs. Um, so it's really kind of cool that already in just a matter of a week or so you have these si these systems that are forming okay so last last time i'm not going to talk too much more about it i'll show you a little clip by the third week of development the nervous system digestive system had begun to form okay the placenta which is a connection between the mother and the developing embryo delivering nutrients and oxygen has already formed okay so that's just by the third week that's a, you don't even know you're pregnant yet okay so by three weeks you have the placenta that's feeding and giving all the nutrients to this baby. Okay, the placenta is the organ of respiration, nutrition, and excretion. So it's so important. After eight weeks, it's called a fetus. So by about five weeks is when people can start to um, take those pregnancy tests and you can um, you know, find out that you're pregnant. So up until then, you have so much that's happening, so much in your body, so many things to take care of, that if you become pregnant, and you're not take care, taking care of yourself in these early stages when all of those um, you know, systems are forming, that can be detrimental to your baby. By the end of three months, most major organs and tissues are fully formed. The muscular system is well developed and begins to move. So just in three months, now you have most of your major organs, your brain, um, those tissues are fully formed, your muscular system, so that baby is now moving. Okay? You may not be able to feel it because it's still very small, but that baby is moving around. So here you can see fertilization, okay, and then here's one week, two weeks, three weeks is an embryo, four week embryo, where you can already see it, there's a heartbeat and a brain that's forming um, actually in week three and starts to um, develop further. Five week embryo, six week, seven week, eight week, nine week it's called a fetus, okay, and then all the way to a 12 week fetus, who, which 12 weeks is only just the first trimester and um, really pretty much has everything there that we have, which is pretty cool to think about. Okay, so pregnancy, what happens after fertilization? So you have um, the implantation, okay, and then the development from the first trimester, second trimester, third trimester. Now I'm not gonna go into this into detail, but if any of you guys ever have any questions specifically on that, I can go in, but the first trimester 
is a lot of the major development of all of those systems, okay? It's a very, very important time. Not that the second and third aren't, but second and third trimester are primarily more about just growth um, and further developing fine kind of, you know, details of those um, different systems, okay? And the third trimester, a lot of those things have been fully developed, but now we're just putting on weight and growing, okay? So those are the big things in the third trimester. So here's a clip from a movie. Um, just showing a little bit about how things progress in um, childbirth, or not child, childbirth, but um, within the womb. This animation will show how your baby develops during pregnancy. Click the navigation arrows below the animation screen to play, pause, rewind, or fast forward the animation. Pregnancy usually lasts about 9 months or 40 weeks and is divided into trimesters. The first trimester is from week 1 until week 12. The second trimester is between weeks 13 and 26 and the third trimester is from week 27 until birth. If you become pregnant, your womb doesn't shed its lining as it normally does at the end of the menstrual cycle, so your periods temporarily stop. This is because the egg, which has been released from one of the ovaries, has been fertilized by a sperm, and you are in the early weeks of pregnancy. Here we show the ovaries, the fallopian tubes, the womb and the vagina. The fertilized egg has already started to divide in the fallopian tube. It will continue to develop and grow in the womb and is called an embryo at this stage. Here we show the embryo in the womb. By week 9 the embryo has developed and is called a fetus. At this point most of the organs including the nervous system and heart are forming. Here we show the fetus in the womb. By the time you are 12 weeks pregnant, your baby is approximately 6 centimeters or 2.5 inches long. At this stage, your baby's neck is uncurling and the limbs are complete. The eyelids are still fused and the ears are forming. Here we show the baby the umbilical cord, the placenta, and the amniotic fluid. The umbilical cord connects the baby to the placenta. This is how your baby gets nutrients and how waste, such as urine, is removed. In the second trimester, your baby's sex organs develop and other organs mature. The baby swallows amniotic fluid and passes it out through its digestive system. The kidneys start to work and pass small amounts of urine. Your baby can now hear and is covered in fine hair called lanugo. Here we show the baby in the second trimester. You may first feel the baby move in the second trimester of pregnancy. The movements become much more vigorous and obvious as the baby gets bigger and stronger. Braxton Hicks, or practice contractions, are painless tightenings of the womb that may start from around 20 weeks of pregnancy. Your baby's lungs mature throughout the third trimester. The baby makes breathing movements even though the lungs don't work properly until birth. The baby grows fine hair and fingernails. The eyes open and close, and teeth may start growing under the gums. Your baby's fat stores also increase in preparation for birth. Braxton Hicks contractions become stronger in the third trimester. At the end of your pregnancy, your baby changes position so it is ready for birth. The baby's head may not engage, that is, move into the position in the pelvis for birth until labor. This is the end of the animation. Click on the animation screen to... There you have it. Okay, so it gives you guys some good details. 
about how the baby um, progressively grows in the womb. Okay, childbirth. <laughs> Everything you guys want to know and don't want to know. No, I won't be too graphic with you guys, but there are three stages of labor. You have dilation, expulsion, and placental. The dilation is where the cervix does dilate. You have to get to um, 10 centimeters, where that is when the baby is actually be, is ready to be expelled. Like, I was going to say expelled, but that's how it is. But, by the way, get a load of that picture. I think it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> so, um, the, the baby is expelled, and then after that, you actually have to deliver the placenta as well. Um, so those are the three stages of childbirth. There are complications during childbirth, um, many of them that I won't go into in too much detail, but again, if you guys have specific questions, never hesitate to ask me. I will go over anything you would like in more detail. But sometimes you have to have an emergency C-section due to many different reasons. An umbilical cord wrapped around um, a baby's neck so that it's cutting off oxygen. Um, depending on which position a baby is in, breach where they are feet down, here's a, what we call incomplete breach, one foot's down, and frank breach where they would come out bum first. Okay, all of these can be very difficult to deliver. And if they don't turn, um, you have to ha end up having an emergency C-section. Also, again, many other reasons why you might have an uh, emergency C-section. Blood loss, um, again, you can lose a lot of blood. Typically, that's easily remedied. Um, when you lose a lot of blood, they can uh, give you a shot of Pitocin, which basically can cause your blood vessels to kind of constrict and stop that bleeding. Um, so, interesting. Different ways of giving birth. So, there's a traditional way of laying down, although that's becoming less and less common because they're realizing that as you lay down, I shouldn't say it's becoming less common, there's new ways that people are finding of giving birth. But laying down, you have to actually push your baby up and over your kind of um, your pelvic, your pelvic bone, and gravity is not working to help you. So I tend to think that that's not the best way because when you are standing up or giving birth, um, I actually gave birth in water and it was amazing because uh, it just seemed a little bit more natural um, and much quicker. There's also squatting methods. So there's many ways of giving birth these days. Um, uh, so anyways, I could go on and talk about that, but I won't gross you guys out. If you have more questions, just always let me know. Okay, one more video and then we're going to be done. Here you go. Later. In the weeks before birth, your body slows down production of the hormone progesterone while increasing production of other hormones, including prostaglandins, which soften the cervix, and oxytocin, which triggers the uterine muscles to contract. True labor contractions are rhythmic and painful and grow consistently stronger. As the long vertical muscle bands of the uterus tighten, they pull the cervix open. The strong muscles at the top of the uterus push down and release, guiding your baby toward the cervix. The mucus plug, a collection of thickened cervical mucus that sealed your cervix shut for nine months, may be expelled days before or in the midst of labor. When the amniotic sac ruptures, your water has broken. It can feel like a trickle or a gush of fluid. Your cervix will begin opening and thinning, known as dilation and effacement. Once you reach about four centimeters, your body will move into active labor. In active labor, contractions become stronger and closer together. At eight centimeters, you enter what many consider the most painful part of labor, transition. By 10 centimeters, you're fully dilated and may feel the urge to push. This is your signal that the second stage of labor has begun. Your baby will move down with each contraction. The three separate soft bones of his head will temporarily overlap so he can pass through the snug birth canal. Your baby's scalp will come into view. When the widest part of his head is visible, your baby is crowning. With several more pushes, your baby's face, shoulders, and body will emerge. In the third and final stage of labor, your placenta detaches and is expelled. With your baby's first breath, the incredible journey of birth is complete. on anything, please never hesitate to email me or ask me. Um, I'm always willing to help you guys out. There you have it, done with animal organization.